Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Herbert C. Kalman seminar uh, series. And I'd just like to remind you that this seminar is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. Um, we can't believe our good luck here that we, um, we're having this seminar on the update seminar on Ukraine 24 hours after the president of Ukraine leaves the United States. So we are, we are full of anticipation uh, for this discussion. And I'm thrilled that Alexandra was able to join us again. Uh, but before I uh, go into detail about the seminar, uh, the format and so on, I wanted to just explain that um, there's an exciting new fellowship um, opportunity. It's called the Herbert C. Kelman uh, Fellowships. And the Weatherhead Center is inviting people to apply. And this, um, this would be for students, for graduate students who are uh, focusing and are interested in the research on the causes, prevention, and resolution of international and, and ethnic conflicts, and especially the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because as many of you know, Professor Kelman dedicated his life to trying to bring some insight and closure into that conflict. Um, but he's also, um, if people are interested in reconciliation in general between communities within and across states with a history of protracted violent conflict, you should apply to. So this fun funding has been provided by him, Professor Kelman and his family. And there is a link in the chat right now uh, Diane put a link in the chat to um, uh, for you to apply if any of you are interested, and all the details are in there as well. And just to remind you that the deadline for these fellowships um, is February 12th, 2024. And uh, again, before we start, I always want to thank uh, our, our, our team here for helping us with this, Lindsay and Diane Long and uh, James Perwin, Nicole Bryan, of course, the executive director, managing director of program on negotiation. We're 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 very very um, fortunate to be able to work together on this important topic of that, especially today, that uh, Alexandra is going to be um, introducing to us and talking about. So, Alexandra, I mean, just. Um, uh, I'll introduce her in a, in a second, but I also want to tell you before we get started that she's going to be talking for about 35 minutes, after which we'll have a, a Q&A. And if you put your questions in the Q&A function, I will then read them uh, to her and she will respond. And also, um, the other thing is that this seminar is going to be recorded. So if you're interested, wait a couple of days and take a look at the PON um, website. And if you want to take a look at um, at this at her presentation again, you, you're welcome to do that. So Alexandra Vakro is the executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies here at Harvard. And her scholarly work addresses many Russian and Eurasian policy issues. As director of the graduate studies for the Davis Center's master's program, she has uh, mentored dozens of Harvard's best and brightest students and regional experts. She lived in Moscow from 1992 to 2004. While there, she held a number of positions, including consultant for the Repub a Russian uh, privatization agency uh, as a partner and head of sales at the Brunswick Warburg Investment Bank, an active member of the board of the United Way Moscow. While completing her dissertation, on corruption in Russian pharmaceutical markets, she was affiliated with the Center for Economic and Russian Pharmaceutical Markets, and she was affiliated um, with a Russian think tank associated with new economic, the new, new economic school. So prior to joining the Davis Center in 2010, Alexandra lived in Washington, DC, where she was a scholar at the Kennan Institute, part of the Wilson Center for Scholars. And you know, before I turn this over, um, I'm going to ask um, Alexandra if she would explain. She just told us just just a couple of minutes ago about this exciting new 
uh, program that they have. So Alexander, could you, before you start your presentation, explain to people uh, what this new program is all about? Yes, thank you, Donna, for that introduction. Thank you to everyone who's here. Um, and I would love to say a few words about our Scholars Without Borders program, which we started after the war began, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Um, I see from some of the names of people who have joined that uh, we have some representatives from our network, uh, which assists scholars who have been affected by the war in Ukraine, either internally displaced or have had their universities uh, attacked. Um, also scholars who have left Russia and now find themselves without affiliation in Central Asia and the Caucasus, um, and also scholars from Belarus who have been uh, persecuted because of their political views. So the Scholars Without Borders program, I think there, yeah, there's a, a, a link now in the chat, um, offers an opportunity for anybody who wants to help display scholars or have contact with them or create collaborative research projects, the opportunity to find people that are very interested in continuing their research uh, in quite difficult conditions. So we have a person, Dan Epstein, who works at the Davis Center. He's in Kiev right now talking with, uh, with some of the universities there. Um, and we also have Alexander Abashkin in Tbilisi, who works with some of the, uh, the Russians and Belarusians who are in exile. If you're interested at all, please go to that link in the chat. So after that public service announcement, let me go straight to my talk. Um, I have a lot to cover, and uh, I'll be going pretty fast. But... If you have questions, please put them in the q and I think that is the, um, the requested format. And then Adana is going to read them to me later. So let me share my screen. OK, so war in Ukraine, it's been going on uh, over 21 months now. And a lot of people are perhaps thinking that nothing particularly important is happening there or have gotten used to it or numb to what's happening. And one of the objectives of this talk is to remind you that there is a lot at stake in this war. And even though President Zelensky was not successful in reminding Congress of this yesterday, um, that is more a function of domestic political problems in the US than the objective geopolitical importance of the conflict. So I'm going to give you a pretty comprehensive overview of where we are now and what the implications have been for Ukraine and for Russia. Um, I can't do everything, obviously. Um, so I'm going to try and point out some of the weaknesses and some of the long-term impacts for Russia, uh, because that is going to be ultimately what drives the Russians to hopefully come to, uh, to realize that this was a, a tremendous misadventure. So let me move forward. So just a quick recap. Uh, this is how the full-scale invasion started. And we say full-scale invasion to distinguish from 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea in the south and also uh, supported the separatist in the east in the Donbass area. You can see in this map, Crimea is the striped area at the bottom. The Donbass is the dark yellow area on the right. Russia had already occupied uh, those in 2014, but in February 2022, they launched a full-scale invasion from the north, uh, partially through Belarus, uh, from the west, from Russia's west into uh, Ukraine's east and also up from the south through Crimea. Uh, things did not go particularly well. Apparently, the Russians had thought that they would be able to take Kiev in three days, even though the uh, the troop to task ratio was completely wrong. Right? They had 190,000 troops massed along an enormous border, uh, and it's difficult to imagine that they would have been able to pacify a population of over 40 million people with so few troops. Unless, of course, they thought that the Ukrainians were going to be greeting with them, greeting them with the traditional bread and salt uh, welcome uh, from Slavic cultures, that did not happen. And as a result, the Ukrainians uh, managed to heroically push back the Russians. So, if we look at where the Russians were occupying. Ukraine in March of 2022, we see that there were large swaths of territory that had Russian troops. Uh, these were primarily along the railroad lines with the Russian, which the Russians use in order to move their, their materiel and some of their troops. Um, but by November 30th, so a couple of weeks ago, the Russians have been pushed back now into the south and into the east. And you'll uh, probably recall that they did a fake referendum and decided that those territories, those four annexed uh, or four occupied territories were going to become part of Russia, even though they don't actually occupy all of that territory. 
Now, there was a counteroffensive from Ukraine over the summer. It does not appear to have been as successful as was hoped, in part because it took so long for the West to give the Ukrainians the sort of long distance uh, artillery and equipment that they needed to mount what would have been a successful counteroffensive. And in the meantime, the Russians managed to create some incredible defenses of trenches and dragon's teeth that made any advancement along those lines very difficult. So if we look at what's been happening, I would not call it a frozen conflict because there's a lot of fighting every day, but it's along fairly small uh, pieces of territory. About 500 square miles of territory have changed hands in the past few months or so, and they tend to be along the line of contact in the south, this is the Kherson region, and also around Bakhmut and Avdiivka, which is in the northeast uh, part of Ukraine. So it, very important areas, very bloody conflict still, but no significant uh, changes along the line of contact. I, I wouldn't call it a frozen conflict, though, um, in part because the Russians are not only working uh, to attack the Ukrainians in these areas and hold their lines, but they also continue to do large scale air attacks. So this is a map that was released by the, uh, the Ukrainian military command that shows Russian air attacks with missiles and drones for a 40 minute period on October 10th between 1020 and 11 p.m. at night. And as you can see, the strikes against Ukraine are still hitting across the entire country. They are still targeting infrastructure um, and they are still causing a lot of damage. How much damage you ask? Well, um, what we don't see from looking at maps is what it looks like on the ground, which is rubble. Um, and if we try and assess the cost of rebuilding some of those facilities, uh, you can see that we're easily talking about billions of dollars. Most of what the Russians have hit has been residential buildings and housing. Uh, also transport infrastructure like railroad stations uh, and airports and railroad tracks, uh, industry and business. So we've all seen those pictures of Azov Steel, the big factory that was in Mariupol that's basically now leveled. Uh, schools, both primary schools, middle schools, high schools, universities have been very hard hit. Um, and when I met uh, in Kiev this summer with some of the rectors of universities that were in the territories now occupied by Russia, they were telling just unimaginable stories. You know, the Russian troops occupy the dorms and start shooting at the students from the windows. Or the Russians come and they clear the classrooms of all of the equipment, the servers, the projectors, uh, and take them back to Russia. So even though these numbers appear to be quite abstract, when you think about what that actually involves on the ground, you realize the impact to a country, right? Take energy, for example. So. Russia is consistently targeting, particularly in winter, anything that is going to be used to heat uh, Ukrainian housing and also provide the electricity that you need, for example, to run elevators up apartment buildings or to pump water from sanitation facilities into buildings. Uh, the objective of the Russians is to make life as difficult as possible. The other important thing here, agriculture and land, the Russians have been targeting all possible ways to reduce uh, Ukrainian agriculture exports. So that means uh, the ability of farmers to plant seeds, uh, partially by mining the, uh, the land and by using cluster bombs, the ability to harvest the crops, the ability to store them. You've probably seen there have been missile strikes specifically on grain storage facilities, and then the ability to export um, by shipping through the Black Sea. There have been alternative uh, routes that have been developed in order to get Ukrainian grain exports out. Um, but the fact is that you really need big uh, ocean tankers in order to move the kind of grain that uh, Ukraine was exporting before. Ukraine and Russia together had about 30% of global grain exports before the war. The other thing that all of these maps and all of these numbers don't show is the human toll, which has been horrific, uh, both in terms of the civilian population, the soldiers in Ukraine, uh, but also on the Russian side, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. So why did Russia uh, do this? Why did Russia decide that a full-scale invasion was in its interest? The fact is we don't, we don't really know. Um, and when my students tell me that they're going to write a thesis that uh, identifies the underlying reasons for Russian's attack, I, I tell them that it's going to be very difficult if the answer to that question requires that you know what Putin is thinking. We don't know what Putin is thinking. We know what the Russians, the Kremlin has said about why they invaded Ukraine. Uh, and there have been five major narratives that have been used. 
um, and I just want to go through them quickly because they're important later. Uh, one is NATO made me do it, right? This argument is that NATO has expanded consistently since the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, pressing closer and closer to Russia's borders, uh, and Russia felt threatened and therefore realized that it had to go on the offensive uh, in order to keep NATO from getting very close. Uh, and it did this in 2008 when it uh, took over part of Georgia and occupied it, uh, making it very difficult for Georgia to potentially join uh, NATO because now they have contested territory. And it did this again uh, in Ukraine. One of the weaknesses of this argument, and it's possible that the Russians believe it, right? What's important here is kind of the Russian perception of whether or not they think NATO is aggressive rather than whether we think NATO is aggressive. But if the Russians really thought that NATO was aggressive, they wouldn't have pulled their troops away from the border with Finland, the 830 mile border with Finland, when Finland joined NATO. That suggests to me that they're not all that worried about a NATO attack or invasion. The second reason is legitimation. So uh, you might say, why would an autocrat or a dictator need to have legitimation when he can rule through force or through fear? And the fact is, as one of my uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Fry, says, it's much easier to be a popular autocrat than an unpopular autocrat. So even autocrats like to win elections. And if we look at the approval ratings of Putin, we can see that there is a big jump in 2014 when Crimea is annexed and there's a rally around the flag effect. And then Putin's popularity gradually starts coming down again. The economy isn't doing so great. Um, there's not that much progress happening. The oil price has come down and it is possible, again, we don't know for sure, it is possible that Putin thought that he was going to have a boost in popularity by taking more of Ukraine. And possibly he thought this wasn't going to be so difficult, so it was worth it. So what we see in the far right of this graph is indeed an increase in Putin's popularity after the invasion of Crimea, though you can see it tapers off and it tapers off when there's mandatory conscription that comes into place in September. Uh, and what that has done is uh, make people apprehensive that the war might have a personal impact on them uh, and therefore slightly temper his approval ratings, which I would point out, this shows that they're between 60 and 80%. Uh, those numbers may or may not be real, but I think what's significant here is the trends. And the fact is that for the most part, the Crimean uh, invasion and then the full-scale invasion of Russia have been popular enough in Russia to sustain Putin's popularity ratings. Now, Putin is running for pre for re-election in March 2024, real dark horse candidate, um, and um, it is likely that they're going to need to do another round of conscription, but they won't do it before those elections because they know that they're unpopular. And Russia has had more and more trouble getting people to want to fight in the war. And so they've resorted to all sorts of uh, campaigns. Uh, the one that is uh, that has been running lately is a series of TV ads. And it's Russians in uh, kind of dead end jobs like a uh, taxi driver, or uh, a mall cop and they're sitting around, they can't buy their daughter an iPhone, which she asked for, it's not an iPhone anymore, but a, a smartphone. And so they decide that they're going to join the military and go fight in Ukraine so that they can uh, be a real man and support their family. Um, and this is kind of the tagline, you know, you're a man, act like it. It's not super successful, uh, which is why they've tried other things now, like two soldiers sitting around saying, I can't wait to buy an apartment in Odessa that's going to be so lovely. So they're really trying to pull out all the stops, but it's not easy to convince people to fight in a war where some 315,000 Russian men are estimated to have been killed uh, on the front. What are the other reasons that Putin gives? Well, another one is the idea that Ukraine isn't even really a country. Uh, and Putin wrote an essay in June of 2021 saying, well, you know, Ukraine was created by a stroke of Lenin's pen. It was such an error. We've always been the same people. Um, and uh, we should just accept that this is all part of Russian lands. Now, the Ukrainians do not accept that argument. And I would point out that Ukrainian as a language is much closer to Polish than it is to Russian. Um, so there are arguments uh, against that, that, uh, that narrative. But there does seem to be a significant portion of the Russian elite that wants to believe that Ukraine doesn't deserve to be its own country. And so Russia is basically just restoring its right over these territories. Now, if that's true, and Russia believes that it has a right to control Ukraine, it actually doesn't matter what NATO does, 
right? Because Russia gets to control Ukraine and they might have preferred to do it politically like they've done in some areas of the uh, former Soviet Union. But when they can do that, they decided to do militarily and NATO doesn't really come into it. What comes into it is how the Ukrainians feel. And if the Ukrainians are moving further and further away from Russia, that might be the threat to Russia uh, being able to control it. Which ties into the last argument, which is that Russia has a demographic problem. The population is obviously half or much, much less than it was when it was the Soviet Union. Um, and so there's a bit of insecurity over the fact that they are uh, losing a certain number of people every year because of the low birth rate and because of low life expectancy. And so Russia has tried to promulgate this idea um, that they have the right to protect Russians. And Russians are often designed, uh, designated as Russian speakers. So it doesn't matter if you have a Russian passport. It doesn't matter if you identify as a Russian citizen, right? It doesn't even really matter if you speak Russian at home because many Ukrainians who sp spoke Russian at home, people from the East never wanted to be part of Russia, but they might have spoken Russian. Um, but to, to Moscow, the idea that they're protecting Russian speaking populations from potential oppression uh, is one of the arguments that's given. And if we look at a map of where there are Russian speakers in the area around Russia, this is the former Soviet uh, Union, you can see this is a map from 2014, by the way, um, and the data is from the late 2000s. So you can see that in Ukraine, yes, the eastern part of Ukraine had a lot of Russian speakers, Belarus also, many Russian speakers, some parts of the Baltics, and also northern Kazakhstan has a lot of Russian speakers, about 3 million people. So if you're a country with a demographic problem and you see these Russian speakers on your borders and you think that there's a way to count them as Russians, then you have an incentive to try and think about how you could get more control over those people. And perhaps that's why Russia thinks, okay, like Crimea, that was a, a few million people. Um, and taking the Eastern part of Ukraine, that could be you know, another four or 5 million people maybe. And Kazakhstan, 3 million people, like you start to reverse your demographic problem. Uh, the last argument that Russia makes is that it went into Ukraine to denazify it, right? And denazify in this case is actually a euphemism. It's a euphemism for get the the uh, Ukrainian elected president out of office and replace it with someone who's favorable to Russia, right? On its face, the argument is rather ridiculous, considering that Zelensky is himself Jewish. Um, I would not say that there are no Nazis in Ukraine, right? There are Nazis in Ukraine. There are Nazis in Russia. There are Nazis in the United States. Like there are people who are far right wing Nazi supporters almost everywhere in the world. Uh, but Ukraine is not run by Nazis. That is just not true. But it, as I said, it's a euphemism for being able to control Ukraine. And what all of these explanations have in common is that they have no regard for Ukrainian agency. And if you look at this uh, rally that was in 2014, January 1st, 2014, um, a rally in support of joining the, the, the uh, European Union, uh, you have to remember that Ukrainians actually have their own ideas of which alliance they would like to belong to, which part of the world they feel more closely allied to. And even though Russia might have its reasons for invading Ukraine, what's more important is what the Ukrainians want for Ukraine. And I think it's very important for us not to lose sight of that. And once the invasion happened, there was a pretty significant response and it took several forms. So one form is in terms of direct support, a military, humanitarian, and financial. And I have this data here because what it shows you is that the EU has really stepped up in terms of providing financial and humanitarian assistance. Um, and this financial assistance, for example, is to pay the bills in Ukraine, to pay salaries, uh, to pay school teachers. Um, but it's not the most military aid. The most military aid is still coming from the United States. Uh, and by the way, I would point out there was a very good article in the Washington Post a couple of days ago that pointed out that the, the money that's going to support Ukraine militarily is actually mostly being spent in the US in the factories that are producing shells and javelins and stinger missiles and all of the equipment uh, that's then being sent to Ukraine. So there is no way to replace the United States contribution to Ukraine's military. 
right? Maybe the Ukrainians are going to be able to step up production in a couple of years to be able to replace the United States. The Finns are stepping up their production. But the fact is that if Congress does not pass the military aid to Ukraine, once we run out of the $100 million or so that haven't been spent yet, Ukraine has a serious problem. Like they are not going to be able to keep defending the skies, for example, when they start running out of Patriot missiles. Um, and the fact that Congress won't vote on that is frankly an outrage. The other area of uh, reaction was in terms of sanctions. Uh, and the sanctions here, I grouped them into four buckets, if you will. One was tackling logistics and trade, uh, like semiconductors and oil. One was financial sanctions, which were pretty serious. They included freezing $300 million of central bank reserves and kicking Russian banks out of both SWIFT and the correspondent bank system, which allows you to use dollars, which is a very important part of uh, the way money moves internationally. Uh, individual sanctions against oligarchs, the yachts, and things like that. Uh, and the self-sanctioning of corporates who decided to pull out of Russia and also brain drain, which I'll return to. All of these sanctions were put in place both immediately and in subsequent waves. I think we're on the 11th wave now. Um, and so it's a good time to ask, like, have the sanctions really worked? And the answer to that um, is rather nuanced. So on the one hand, there are areas where sanctions are biting. Uh, foreign car producers uh, or car assembly plants have largely pulled out of Russia and have been replaced by Chinese cars. Uh, that being said, don't worry, there are plenty of luxury cars still making it to Moscow, and I'll tell you how in a second. Uh, and then some of the big companies like IKEA uh, pulled out, although they have been replaced, McDonald's also, they have been replaced by homegrown uh, copycats that are either producing the or selling the inventory that was left over um, or producing roughly similar things to what was being sold before. So there has been some impact, but the regime has been very careful to try and keep the standard of living stable. Um, and they've been able to do this because sanctions have not significantly reduced the amount of income that the Russians are getting from the sale of fossil fuel exports. This is the amount that Russia is earning every day from the sale of fossil fuel exports. You can see that it is consistently above 500 million euros a day. Estimates are that it's costing Russia about 300 million euros a day to fight the war in Ukraine. So on an average day, they are still pulling in more from fossil fuel sales than they are expending on the war in Ukraine. Now, I know what you're asking. I thought we had a, a, an oil price cap. I thought that we had embargoed uh, all of the, all of the uh, Russian imports of natural gas to Europe. Uh, and we have, but guess what? There are other buyers out there, uh, most significant of which is China, which has been uh, lapping up that Russian crude oil at a discount, thanks to the price cap, since uh, the, the, um, the embargoes were imposed. The EU has also still continued to buy some Russian fossil fuel imports, um, particularly through Hungary and Slovakia, um, and some natural gas through LNG. Um, India has also taken advantage of the fact that there's uh, they have very good refineries in uh, India when it comes to refining Russian crude, which has a slightly different chemical mix as, uh, as some of the other crude oil sources. Uh, and the Indians are refining this Russian crude and then selling it as diesel fuel and petroleum products into Europe, uh, which I should say Europe is quite grateful for because otherwise they would have uh, a deficit. Turkey and the United Arab Emirates are also buyers. And I know what you're thinking. Why is the United Arab Emirates uh, and Saudi Arabia, for that matter, buying Russian crude? And the fact is that they are buying fuel oil, so petroleum products, because it is cheaper for them to buy Russian fuel oil and continue exporting their crude at the higher market prices. So essentially, the price is a little lower. Global oil prices are lower, but Russia is still making plenty of money from selling uh, Russian crude and petroleum products and natural gas and now LNG also, which they're developing quite actively. And that's not all, right? Russia is still selling grain. Um, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of information here, but what it shows you is uh, the exports, wheat exports from major exporters. And I would draw your attention to the far right where you see that Russian exports have been climbing. That's the dark blue line. Um, as Ukraines are, fa are falling, that's the red block on the right. 
So in general, exports are higher because it was a good grain harvest this year. Um, but uh, Russia has managed to take some of the Ukrainian grain to steal Ukrainian grain and ship it out as its own. And it's possible that another reason that Russia was particularly interested in seizing some of those uh, southern regions is because they expected that they were going to be able to dominate some of those grain markets uh, and also the Sea of Azov, which was going to allow them to uh, increase their command over the, uh, the grain markets. The other place where Russia is doing quite well are nuclear exports. There are nuclear sales of uh, reactors that they build, and then the uranium, the enriched fuel that they sell, went up 20% last year. Uh, and I should point out that even the US buys uranium from, uh, from Russia, as do many European countries, because over the course of the past 20 years, we reduced domestic production and thought that that was okay. And now the result is that Russia is a very attractive uh, builder of Russian nuclear of uh, nuclear power plants because they're less expensive. And it's a little bit like the razor blade model, right? You buy the Russian uh, reactor and then you continue buying the enriched fuel that you need from Russia for many years afterwards. The other Russian export product uh, is the Wagner Group, whatever it's going to be called or whatever it looks like, they have continued to make a point of going into Africa and convincing different African leaders or juntas that they can provide the kind of security service that uh, those leaders would appreciate. So Libya, particularly Eastern Libya, is being used as a logistics hub for Russian activities in Africa. And some of the other leaders uh, continue to use uh, Wagner as uh, an excellent security service. Now, in order to be producing all of these goods that they're exporting, Russia still needs to be importing. But we thought that we had blocked Russian imports, uh, and we did for a while. If you look at this graph, this shows you uh, Russian imports or the value of manufactured goods going into Russia. And you can see that dip on the right does represent what happened when the war started and uh, sanctions were imposed and particularly Europe stopped exports into uh, into Russia. However, the problem with sanctions is that unless you continually tighten them, they get weaker and weaker. And what we see is that there are more and more workarounds through what are called parallel imports, which is where you have other countries like Armenia and Georgia and Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan who are importing goods, no problem, Coca-Cola, Mercedes, whatever, and then selling them into Russia. So uh, Mercedes-Benz reported that it had sold the same number of, or no, I'm sorry, luxury car producers, Mercedes, Maybach, Bentley, Rolls-Royce, sold $100 million of cars that ultimately went to Russia last year, thanks to these parallel import schemes. All of that means that Moscow does not look like this, which is what it looked like in 1992. Moscow looks like this. Girls in cafes, taking selfies. Yes, there are now advertisements outside the window for recruitment into the armed forces, but for the most part, life goes on as normal and that's by design so that people don't think that Putin has somehow disrupted their daily, daily life. Now, Moscow looks like this, St. Petersburg looks like this, Rural Russia does not look like this and never has, but probably the standard of living in rural Russia is roughly the same as what it was before the war, which is to say not great. Mostly Russian products in one small local uh, grocery store or kiosk, probably more or less equipped as it was before. In Moscow and St. Petersburg, however, which are where you would potentially have demonstrations that could be unsettling for the government, you can still get Coca-Cola, not made in Russia anymore, imported from Turkey or Hungary or Poland. As you can see here, these are Coca-Cola bottles from three different places. And you can even get a cappuccino Barbie in Moscow. A friend of mine sent me this when I asked whether they were feeling the impact of the war. And she said, well, no, look at this advertisement. She said, the one thing that's odd, right? And that's disturbing is that even after the war in Afghanistan, you had uh, Afghan veterans on the street. You saw disabled people, mostly because they were not being treated well. Um, but now you see no disabled people on the streets of Moscow. We don't know where they are. There must be quite a lot. If they have 315,000 people that have been killed, the number of casualties or the number of, of injuries is going to be several times that. And yet those people right now are invisible. 
So what does this tell us about Russia's economic outcome? Well, it's honestly not so bad. The economy has shifted to a war mobilization economy where the military industrial complex is providing most of the demand. And so the economy did not dip the 10 or 15% that we had expected or forecast when the war began, but it was more like 2% last year, down 2% last year. And it's probably going to be between zero and 2% this year. Now, this doesn't mean that it's stable over the long term, because at some point when the war stops and the shooting stops and demand for war related equipment stops, the economy is now going to have to shift back to providing normal consumer goods, and that's going to be a pretty painful process. But for now, the economy keeps tooling along and defense spending is not suffering. In fact, defense spending is going to be 30% of 2024 expenditures. So if they need to move money from social services or road building or infrastructure projects into defense, they will, but they'll probably make sure that at least pensions are increased before the March 2024 elections so that Putin can rely on those voters. If the economic situation is fairly stable, what has been the geopolitical impact? Well, Putin is not all that isolated, right? I mean, he's isolated from the West, from the United States, and from the European countries and the 34 countries or so that have been imposed sanctions. But we kid ourselves if we think that the whole world has turned against Russia and thinks that their aggression uh, is outrageous. So this is a picture from December 6. Putin went to visit the United Arab Emirates and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. And uh, I think it's quite important for us to remember that he still has plenty of friends in the so-called global South, across Africa, the Middle East, uh, in Latin America, countries that are perfectly willing to continue buying grain and fertilizer, um, and especially if they can get some of it at, at a discount, they're very happy to have that. Although, frankly, most would rather that the West would just uh, push Ukraine into signing some kind of concessions so that we can get back to business as usual. This has come as at some cost to Putin though, and one is his dependence on Xi Jinping and China. Before the war started, they had announced a, a so-called no limits partnership, which was not an alliance, but was supposed to be a very close partnership. Uh, and there are indications that Xi has moved away from that wide understanding of what support for Russia looks like, but nonetheless, uh, they are still consistent supporters of Russia, both geopolitically and economically, as a buyer of what Russia is selling and also as a seller of what Russia needs, including uh, semiconductors and uh, cars and other products. They are not, however, doing everything that Russia wants, right? This is not the kind of mutually dependent relationship. And for me, one of the best examples of that is China's unwillingness to sign the agreement for the power of Siberia to pipeline. This is a gas pipeline that is, as the name implies, the second pipeline going from Russia into the east. It's very important for Russia because it can no longer use the pipeline infrastructure going to the west that it spent decades building to move natural gas. So it needs new pipelines to go to the east. And China is a very hard bargainer and is not willing to accept higher prices than it has to and has not been signing off on this deal, even though Putin desperately wants them to. Um, and his recent trip to Beijing was again, hopefully promoted by the Russians as an opportunity to sign this agreement. And again, the Chinese refused to sign it. So there is a vulnerability there, and this vulnerability is not going unnoticed by some of the countries that Putin cares most about, which is the so-called near abroad, what Russia calls the Caucasus and the Central Asian countries that were once part of the Soviet Union. Russia has considered itself a great power, therefore deserving of a sphere of influence. And that sphere of influence is kind of the buffer zone of Central Asian and Caucasus countries uh, that it is used to controlling. However, now that it has been distracted by the war, now that it did not come to the rescue of Armenia when Azerbaijan reclaimed Nagorno-Karabakh, those countries are reconsidering their relationship to Russia and realizing that first of all, maybe Russia doesn't provide the kind of security guarantees that it promised. And second of all, maybe they don't need to kowtow to Russia under fear that something terrible will happen because Russia has been so distracted and weakened by the war in Ukraine. And if we look at this picture, for example, this was from September, 2022. Uh, and it used to be that everyone was sitting around laughing at Putin's jokes 
But now everyone is sitting around laughing at Erdogan's jokes. And you can see Putin is on the couch next to Lukashenko uh, and presidents from Central Asia and is just kind of forced to laugh at, uh, at Erdogan's jokes. This is not the way that Russia sees itself, but it is the position that Russia is in right now. So let me um, go quickly now. I, I can see that I'm taking too much time. The dem demographic impact on Russia has been very significant, both in terms of the million or so people that left Russia uh, after the war started and because they feared conscription. Estimates are that this might include over 50% of all of the highly qualified IT and technical specialists. So that's going to be a problem for Russia's economy. You also have up to 315,000 killed in Ukraine, uh, we don't know the official figures. It might be more than that. Uh, but that is a lot of young men in a country that already didn't have that many of them because Russia's demographics still feel the uh, the ongoing echoes of World War II and had a problem of uh, a smaller and smaller young population uh, that would potentially be the source of, um, of the next generation. But the next generation is not being ignored uh, there's a militarization of society, which is difficult to measure in numbers, but basically has the school curriculum from elementary school through university being repurposed in a way that serves this ideological preparation for the need to defend yourself and go to war. Uh, and it's starting at a very young age. So how does this war end? The war termination literature gives a number of possible outcomes, and I'm condensing that into a few a few most likely outcomes. One is a total victory. So what does that look like? Zelensky has said total victory looks like we get all of our territory back going back to 1991 borders. That is going to be very difficult to achieve, especially when you take into account how fortified the Ukraine the Russians are now in Crimea. Um, it, it's difficult to imagine how Ukraine is going to be accomplished, able to accomplish that, given the struggles they had with the counteroffensive. The Russian version of total victory is, uh, as this poster says, Russia's borders don't end anywhere. Basically, Russia gets full control over Ukraine, denazifies it, which means it runs its political process, um, and it's no longer feeling like Ukraine is potentially turning to the West instead of the East. That's also very unlikely. But the problem is, while both sides have this as their goals, and they don't change their goals because they change their minds, you change your goals because you get information on the battlefield that your capability to achieve your goals is not what you thought it was, and therefore you need to revise your goals. It's unclear that either side is at that point, and when Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, was asked if Russia would continue fighting, his response was, we have no other options. Right? So even if they understand now that the goals are not achievable, the Russians have convinced themselves that they have to keep going because otherwise they will likely find it very difficult uh, to hold on to power and to, um, to retreat in a way that's going to be convincing and stable. The second option is a negotiated settlement, which we've heard more and more about right now. Um, a negotiated settlement means that both parties come to the table um, they probably freeze the line of conflict roughly where it is now. You could have a demilitarized zone or a militarized zone. So this is what we see in Korea. Um, it's been pretty stable. The armistice in Korea has lasted, after all, since, uh, since the 50s. Um, but the problem is that we have to ask if it would work, right? Um, and in order to understand if it would work, you need to know a couple things, right? One is that you know, what does it mean to concede the occupied territories? Russia now holds about 20% of Ukrainian territory. Probably there are about 5 million Ukrainians there. We don't know for sure because the, the numbers are very difficult. Um, and life in these occupied territories is pretty much terrible, right? There's, there's not good supply to food. Um, access to medical care is now dependent on whether you have a Russian passport in many cases. Uh, doctors are being arrested and deported to Russia if they don't, don't provide medical care for people, or if they do provide medical care for people with Ukrainian passports. Uh, and this map on the lower right shows you facilities, uh, hospitals in the occupied territories that have been taken over by the Russian military and converted into um, uh, facilities for 
military personnel. So uh, giving Russia the occupied territories is basically giving Russia these 5 million people and consigning them to uh, a quality of life that may or may not be close to what we saw in Bucha with, uh, with its war crimes. And we don't know if it would work, right? Because we don't know what Putin's underlying goal was. Given the weakness of some of the arguments for why Putin went to war, it's very difficult to know if just holding the occupied territories would be enough for him. If he wanted to denazify Ukraine, just holding the occupied territories does not accomplish that. And so it's possible that what you have is a situation that is more like, and I hesitate to say this, but what we saw when the West, United States, and France talked to Hitler and convinced him to, uh, or convinced the Czechs that they should really accept the occupation of the Sudetenland um, in exchange for peace, peace in our time. Um, Hitler was very happy to sign this agreement. And as you know, six months later, he was invading uh, the rest of the Czech lands and looking towards Poland. So the analogy is not perfect, but the fact is we don't know if uh, sitting down and conceding those territories would lead to an end of the conflict. I personally don't think so, given what Putin has done. And in order for it to be successful, we also should keep in mind that Ukraine would have to have ironclad security guarantees that Russia finds persuasive. And that might not be Article 5 of NATO, if Ukraine is not in NATO, but it basically has to involve a NATO response. Nothing else will provide Ukraine with the security and deter Putin. So unfortunately, I would say, sorry, this was back to the original reasons, I would say that protracted conflict is the most likely outcome here. And there are a couple mitigating factors that we should take into account, and, and we don't know how they're going to play out. So one is the conflict in the Middle East, which has uh, pushed Ukraine off of the kind of top of the fold of the newspapers. The second is fatigue on both sides. The third is the 2024 presidential election. Right now, Putin assumes that if he just waits until November 2024, Trump has a good chance of winning the election, and then Ukraine is going to be cut off from military support for good, and he can uh, not only solidify control over the occupied territories, but take more of Ukraine. Uh, and then the last factor is China. If China were to reverse its course, if it were to find that uh, relations with the West are more important to it than supporting Russia, it's possible that Putin would be isolated enough among the people that he cares about that provide him with support, that he would then be willing to come to the table and make concessions. But at this point, Putin thinks he's winning. So there's no reason for him to stop and there's no reason for him to come to the table. All right, let me stop there. I'm sorry I spoke too long, but I'm more than happy to take questions. Oh, well, thank you so much. I mean, that was just such an, an amazing amount of information. I'm, 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 I'm digesting. I'm digesting. I'm sure our audience is too. Um, so yeah, there's so many questions here, but just kind of collapsing a couple of them. If if the main reason for Russian aggression um, is was to plan to restore the whole Russian Soviet dynasty and, you know, the empire, who is most vulnerable next? Would it be the Baltic states, uh, Belarus, Moldavia, um, Romania? Who, who needs to be the most frightened at this point? So I, I don't think that the goal is kind of crudely to restore the Soviet Union, right? I think what's important here is Russia's sense of being a great power entitled to a sphere of influence and a buffer zone. Um, but it's realistic about what countries it can it could potentially control. Uh, I, I believe that Putin does not want to fight with NATO, right? I don't think he's going to invade Poland or the Baltics. Um, however, all of those areas with a large number of Russian speaking people um, like Belarus, like Transnistria in Moldova, like potentially Northern Kazakhstan, about which there have been some like not very funny jokes uh, about them being next, like all of those areas are potentially vulnerable. Now, I would not say that Russia is going to turn around and invade another country next year because they've definitely put a lot of, um, well, they've been very, very, the, the, the intervention in Ukraine has been incredibly costly, both in terms of people and in terms of material. And it would take Russia years, several years to rebuild some of that facility. Um, 
But I would say that those countries would be next on the list, if you will. Um, the other thing that's important, which I didn't mention, is that you know if if Russia manages to get some kind of settlement where it gets control over 20% of Ukraine, that is an incredible win for Russia, right? That basically tells Putin that uh, invading another country and basically digging in will essentially get you concessions from the West. And as the West is facing more and more, let's call them questions or skepticism from the global South, from most countries around the world, the influence of the West is going to be very hard hit by uh, whatever we do in Ukraine. So when people say like, why do we care about Ukraine? This is not our problem. The fact is that that American influence rests for, for a large part or to a large extent on the fact that we plus our European allies have controlled a significant part of the global economy for many years. That portion is shrinking um, and it's potentially vulnerable to, um, well, vulnerable to the ascent of China and to the global South deciding they don't really want to play along the rules. We are not there yet, but potentially conceding Ukraine after uh, pulling out of Afghanistan and any attempt by, let's say, a Republican administration to cut off NATO as our allies would severely weaken American influence. Now, people might say we don't care, like all we care about is the United States. But the fact is, like those very people who say that are also the ones who are used to acting like a superpower. And the United States will not be a superpower if we no longer have our NATO allies. So why do you suppose that that seems obvious, right, to me, what you just said? What, what is it about the internal domestic politics that people are kidding themselves about that? You know, I, there's an election, right? There's an election and uh, border security is more animating to people than Ukraine, right? Most Americans, I don't think, care very much about uh, international relations. Uh, and it just makes more sense for, um, for people to focus on domestic issues than international issues. Yeah, but it's but it's very it's very short sighted. Short sighted. Well, here's a it, switching gears a little. I have a this person has a question regarding the frozen asset funds of Russia and the G7 countries. Can the G7 countries legally seize and transfer these funds to help rebuild Ukraine, more torn Ukraine? Okay, so that's a very complicated question. Um, people are really working at it, right? And um, there are different kinds of assets. So there are the frozen reserves, right? And then there are some corporate assets or some other um, you know, non-state reserves that have also been frozen. And the Europeans are working quite actively to see what they could do. For example, uh, the Canadians have tried to sell an airplane that ended up uh, in in uh, Canada, um, and now they would sell it and fund the, fund the Ukrainians. Um, the United States has been somewhat ambivalent about this because it opens the door to seizures of assets um, in the same way, you know, it's a little bit of a far-fetched anal analogy, but in the same way the U.S. Uh, doesn't doesn't want to participate in international criminal courts because they're afraid that U.S. soldiers will potentially be implicated um, or arrested or or vulnerable. I think the U.S. is also reluctant to get involved in the freezing of reserves or the the taking of Russian assets um, because it potentially puts American assets at risk. That being said, there's a lot of momentum for that, um, and I suspect that any kind of negotiated settlement will have a clause that deals with those reserves and explicitly makes them available to Ukraine. So I don't think it's going to happen by legal fiat, but I think eventually it will happen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um... Here's a, an, I think, very interesting question. Do you agree with those who say that Russia was behind the Hamas attacks on October 7th to divert Western attention from Ukraine? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, I think that uh, this has been very convenient for Russia because the less people think about Ukraine, uh, the more that Russia can do. But the the um, the link, if you want, between Ukraine and what's happening in the Middle East is probably going through Iran. Um, and the fact that Iran was supporting Hamas and also Iran and Russia have come very close in part because 
uh, Russia needs Iranian drones. So the fact that uh, that Putin has basically thrown away the relationship with Israel that he was cultivating for the past few decades um, really suggests that that Russia's dependence on Iranian uh, equipment is such that they will be on the Iranian side. But no, I don't think that this was like some master plan to uh, to distract people, although that has been the effect. So uh, th another question here is about the conscription of prisoners by Russia. Yep. Is that still ongoing? And if so, do you know what percent of the Russian, Russian soldiers are prisoners? Uh, so I don't know that. I think it is still happening, but it's not happening through Wagner Group. It's happening directly with the Ministry of Defense. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's successful in producing bodies that you, then you can throw into the so-called meat grinder, which is what the Russians did at Bakhmut, for example. Um, also, the Russians don't really care about those people, right, because they were in jail and they're expendable, and so it doesn't really matter if they're killed or not. Um, there is quite an incentive, though, for some of these uh, people in prisons to in conscript or to in uh, in to uh, sign up for the military, you know, first of all, they're getting a good salary. Second of all, if they get killed, they, they die as heroes as opposed to conscripts. Um, and there's a significant payment to their family back home. So some of the people go into it thinking like, you know, if nothing else, at least I'm out of jail. And if I die, my family will be better off. But it's it's creating, it appears, some significant problems back in Russia as people who came out of the jails, went to Ukraine, survived, go back to their villages and then commit more heinous crimes. Uh, and the people in the villages are very unhappy about that. But the local reporters have been told not to report it. So the numbers are very unclear. You know, in, in a way, we've really lost our ability to know what's happening on the ground in Russia. But I suspect that it is continuing um, and that it is a significant portion, particularly of the troops that are sent in the first waves that they send into battle in order for the Ukrainian forces to reveal themselves and where they're shooting from. They, they really like using the conscripts for that. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Alexandra. And this might be the last question because uh, we need to, um, I need to give Nicole Bryant some uh, time to talk <laughs> about upcoming events uh, at PON. But um, can you envision a potential agreement bringing home the thousands of kidnapped Ukrainian children? So I certainly hope so. I mean, there are negotiations that are ongoing about that. Um, but one of the significant problems is that some of those children are going to be very difficult to find, especially the youngest ones, you know, who might not have been able to, to speak when they were taken. So they don't know their names. They don't have any papers. They can be renamed, sent to several different places, you know, so that their, their location is obscured. I mean, it's wonderful that, that there have been cases of children returning, but there have also been unbelievable cases of Ukrainians basically going into Russia to try and find their kids and bring them back. So that process is still ongoing. That outrage is still continuing. And the longer that that goes on, the more and more difficult it is going to be to identify where those kids are and to bring them back. I mean, I can't imagine anything worse. <laughs> that is just horrific, these children who have been taken. Um, Alexandra, this was wonderful. Once again, you did a, such a fantastic job giving us the background, the context, the information, the numbers, everything uh, that helps us understand this such this so so many complexities to this to this conflict, both on the Russian side and the Ukrainian side. So uh, once again, thank you so very much for taking time to be with us today. And now, uh, Nicole Bryant, the managing director, it's uh, it's yours. <laughs> Well, I'm just going to echo what Donna said, Alexandra. Thank you so much. Uh, I personally learned a lot. I, I see in the chat so many people echoing that sentiment. So thank you. And we are, as ever, very proud uh, to present these series of live events to our audience, really from all over the world. We're thank you, almost 300 people joining us uh, today. Um, and uh, just a note about what's coming up for us. So uh, already planned at the end of January, uh, William Yuri, one of the founders of PON and co-author of Getting to Yes, will be on to talk about his latest book, Possible, How We Survive and Thrive in the Age of Conflict. And of course, our spring programming is already up and online and enrolling. We will also be planning a whole series of uh, other events in January and February. So stay tuned. We are busy scheduling those with our speakers right now, and we'll be providing more details shortly. Thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today, and we wish you all a very 
happy holiday season and a joyous start to 2024. Thank you so much. Be well.